Uh, thank you, Laura, for having us. Great to be here. I uh, really enjoyed hearing Margaret's talk, as I always do. Uh, there's so much richness, and she's such a great economic storyteller, and that whole history context is just ever critical. So super, uh, just feel grateful to be in the room for that. Uh, I've got just a few slides just to level set some data and current data to prime some uh, more qualitative discussion as we go. Uh, is it all there? Yeah, great. Uh, I'm not going to read all this off to you, but it's going to show you where we are. And in fact, I've got several um, charts and slides that, that uh, represent the same data and content to try to get an understanding of where we think we are in December of 2021. Uh, unemployment rates, labor force participation rates, and jobs, those are just some metrics. They're important metrics. They're sort of top-level metrics to understand where the economy is. And in every single one of those, of course, there's a big yeah, but, and we'll, what about this? And let's unpack that, right? So we won't have time to um, delve into all those nuances, but to understand at a high level where we think we are is, I think, a useful place to start. This chart accompanies the, the numbers that were on the slide, and some of those same numbers on the on that first chart will come back in these. Um, this is a grind phase, and apologies for... Uh, for the, um, for the metaphor, but it's the bump and grind recovery. That's what it is, right? It, we, the decline in jobs was unprecedented with the severity and the steepness when we had to shut down an entire global economy. Uh, as Margaret would point out, that's, that's, that's not happened at that abruptness before uh, in dealing with a crisis like that. And so we get a bump back up as soon as we felt some public health confidence and people felt like the risk they were taking on the public health was worth the economic rewards that came with that, and things started to open up. But you cannot shut down global economies and expect it to start back up in a timely manner. So that's the grind that we're in. We have a problem uh, in policy and in interpreting economic data in terms of having a common definition of what is a recovery. Economists generally say that a, that a recovery uh, is when we stop declining. You're either growing or shrinking. But in society, we tend to say, well, what's that benchmark? How do we get back to where we were as we go through these recessions and as we do these recoveries? And I think that sets some false expectations in a lot of cases. The last big recession in, that, that we had was really built on false pretenses. We were out over, uh, over our skis with debt as a society, the housing crisis, and all that bubble, that crash, was because we were leveraging too much of our future to begin with. So we really didn't want to get back to that to that benchmark and need to, to hurry. Uh, and that's what this slide shows, is that these recoveries take a long time to get back to where we are. Uh, every new jobs data that comes out, we end up with, you know, my joke about this is you never see a jobs report that comes out and says, and that's exactly what economists were expecting, right? <laughs> every single one, it's either, it's, it's, it's higher than economists were expected, or it's lower than economists were expected. Economists are really good at explaining the back, the back history. Not really good at all about forecasting what's going to happen next. So that's where we are, starting to work our way back out of this. Unemployment spiked heavily, of course, and is working its way down. Now, we're actually in unemployment rate numbers in context that we have seen in recent years, have been a part of this. It's, it's the yeah, but, and where, and how, and the different industries, and the different mix of how those industries are contributing to that overall unemployment that creates so much complexity that we have to work through. Labor, workers in the labor force is an important piece. I try to uh, get past the percentages so we can see in, in, in with more numeric context of, of exactly where we are. This is the unemployed workers in the labor force. And you can see we're working our way back down to a number closer to where we were before uh, the pandemic started, but we're not there yet. Again, some of the same numbers presented in different ways just to really ground ourselves in where we think we are toward a recovery. Uh, that labor force participation rate is important. The big, uh, that's the blue line across the top. We know there are some major disruptions in the labor force. We know child care and getting women back into the workforce has been a real challenge and it's important for us to focus on. Uh, that labor force participation rate, we've been in this range before too. And it was climbing up and up and up, certainly in the 70s and 80s as the, as the demographics changed and more people were working and choosing to be in the labor force. And then it's declined and the severity of, 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 of the decline in the past couple of years is what we're trying to overcome right now. Uh, I wanted to frame this, this is savings, uh, because this is one of the metrics that is so dramatically different uh, than we're used to seeing. I have been presenting data on savings and debt for a long time with some of my economic talks, and uh, the story all along had been the saving rates are going down and down and down, and the debt per capita and, the, and our comfort level with debt and leveraging ourselves in the future had continued to skyrocket. 
or not skyrocket, but go, go up and up over time. And it was a shock. I never thought in my lifetime we'd see saving rates spike in the way that it has. And it's rational as can be within all of our lived experiences. We didn't have places to spend as much money as we had. If you had income, if you were fortunate enough not to lose your source of income during the pandemic, you simply had fewer places to put it. And that's why you see more money going into the consumer goods. That's why the service industries, the hospitality, the tourism, the visitation industries hurt so poorly because the pandemic shut those down. And all those contributed to higher savings rate. Stimulus packages contributed to higher savings rates too. And those are grossly inefficient tools at the federal level, and that's the cost of doing business at the federal level to help with that. Super necessary uh, investments to save the economy, but with that come some unintended consequences such as this. That savings rates feeds into some of the labor, labor force shortages that we're having, in addition to some of the slides that Margaret showed earlier. These things, there's not one uh, complete explanatory variable, but this is an important part of it that I wanted to make sure we touched on. And finally, just overall, wh where we think we are worldwide with the, um, with the recovery, uh, we see the decline in gross domestic product. Again, an imperfect measure, but uh, one of the better ones we have at a macro level. We saw a, a steep rebound in 2020. Uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, or sorry, steep rebound this year in 2021. Uh, we expect a continued growth in 2022. And those things are important. Uh, those will, you know, th these, the means will revert, or the data will revert back to the means as we move forward, right? So some of the stuff we're going to talk about is what's, what's real, what's going to stick, what's volatile. And this is one of those volatile metrics that we'll see how it plays out. That's my warm up for you. One of the things we want to do is break this down a little bit because we know that uh, our state itself is diverse and complex and uh, the regional realities vary. And so I think I'll, I'll turn uh, first to Marty and then to Brian, uh, Marty Moore with an east of the mountains perspective and, uh, and then to Brian. Uh, so Marty, please briefly introduce yourself and uh, give us a perspective on how you see what's happening from especially uh, your vantage point in the financial uh, industry and as a civic leader in Spokane. Well, thank you, Lisa, and um, thanks to everybody there in the room and on the call today. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the summit here. Um, I'm Marty Dickinson. Um, my day job is I am the Chief Marketing Officer for STCU here in Spokane, Washington. Um, I have a couple other uh, gigs that I do, uh, which is uh, I'm the Board of Regents um, Chair for Washington State University. And um, I'm also the chair of the Public Facilities District here in Spokane, Washington. So I kind of wear a lot of different hats and um, have been in, the, um, in the, the world of leadership and civic engagement for quite a long time on this side of the state, but have known and worked with the Technology Alliance throughout the years as well. So I appreciate the topic um, today of future of work. I think that Everybody is trying to kind of um, solve this, what, what that's gonna be. And for people like myself and probably many of those in the room, like you, you, wanna, you wanna provide certainty, you wanna pro, um, provide solutions. Um, and I think we're in this really interesting grind phase, um, but you actually can't do that because it, the, the, everything is just changing on kind of a daily basis. What we have seen um, in the financial sector is you know, we were hoping to accelerate the access to digital, if you will, um, as to how you do your finances. We were hoping we would really be on this trajectory of um, less bricks and mortar and more digital interaction with our members. And that we thought it would take us probably about five years to kind of get to this optimum level. Well, you know, it took 18 months <laughs> and we got there in a hurry. Um, and now we are in this interesting phase of kind of what's next and how do we meet the needs of our members. And, and that is becoming really interesting because I think the single biggest thing from Washington State University as well as STCU is how do we provide services um, to our rural communities? I mean, we take advantage of living in some of our urban centers, if you will, but for access to broadband, for everything, for a job, for schooling, for um, 
you know, women in particular that want to be able to um, have the balance of working from home, but also um, navigating what it means to have children in today's age. We need broadband and um, our rural communities just simply don't have it. And it is a really significant challenge that STCU um, is diving deep into. And as we look to talk about policy, what can we be doing as a state to really recognize and prioritize, which I know is occurring around how we deliver this, how we create greater access because future of work doesn't matter if there's no access. And we have talented and crazy smart and um, innovative people sitting in our rural communities more so than ever before because I believe we've had a mass exit of folks that don't want to sit in the urban centers um, in particular during this pandemic. And we have seen this growth in Eastern Washington from the West side and California and several other places in a way that we've never ever experienced. And yet we still have this conundrum of access that has to be um, addressed as we go forward. Thanks Marty. And uh, now for a perspective from the other side of the state. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's really great to be here, and it's so great to see so many friends in person again and, and not behind a, a screen. And um, the cliche that I keep hearing from uh, as we emerge from you know, the, the, the multiple crises that we've had is that it's accelerated some long-term trends that we all have been seeing, and this just sparked it. And this, and this is, has been... Uh, a really dynamic forcing function for how we think about our economy, um, who participates in our economy. Um, one great thing about uh, the Puget Sound region, Seattle, um, the, the remarkable diversity of its economy has remained resilient. And I think that's something that we should never lose sight of, you know, the, the, the range of industries that have been able to um, um, survive this, this, this period, and in some cases, really, really explode. Um, I was, you know, got to see my good friend Mark Cummings from Life Science Washington. This is, uh, I feel like the, the life science community is, is entering a, a, a really new golden age, a dynamic age, frankly, where we're seeing massive amounts of new investment, uh, promising companies really pushing the envelope on, on discoveries and, and therapeutics. On the flip side of that, and this is a conversation I think everyone in this room has had around who participates in that, right? And we talk about um, you know, the, the, the persistent wealth gap that we see in our community. And, and you know, for me, um, you, know, those of, you know, those who know me, I, I never like binary things. I, 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 I always feel like there's always a path forward. I think there's something about um, Seattle and this region, our progressive pragmatism around how do we move? How do we really push? How do we make sure that these companies, these entrepreneurs not only prosper, but also that every single uh, member of our community has access to that economy? And there's so many pressures out there. Um, you know, uh, uh, this morning, uh, my organization, we, we recently announced, a, uh, just announced a partnership with Amazon, focusing on um, uh, supporting black developers, housing developers who are interested in affordable housing. So when we, when we start thinking about the context of American capitalism, right, like so much of our wealth is tied into our homes, tied into real estate, and the big question in, in the region that we had around um, our, our, our affordable housing crisis and who's at the table, who's really helping um, address some of the questions around displacement and gentrification, we have to have more representation in real estate. And so that was the starting point and, and the thesis behind our partnership with, with Amazon that, that uh, we're rolling out today. But I think that, that shines a light at how this community from big tech players to community folks can really find solutions. It's like, okay, we're gonna continue prospering. We're gonna continue supporting entrepreneurs because there's something really um, strong about our economic foundations here. And at the same time, we've got the resources, we've got the spirit to make sure that, you know, folks in Skyway, folks in Tacoma, folks in the central area have access um, to, um, to that really strong and dynamic economy. 
thank you for bringing that piece up, and uh, I'll put in a plug. Commerce has an economic recovery dashboard um, uh, that we have been maintaining since the beginning of the pandemic to break down some of the trends by region and by industry and sector and subsector. So take a look at it if you want to see some of the some of the interesting things happening within particular arenas, as Chris and others alluded to, for example, in hospitality um, or in tech. And uh, one of the interesting things we added to it was a county by county breakdown uh, of the data where it's available. And we also added a, um, a piece around support programs in the state. And just to give you a sense of that, uh, right now, and uh, this has come down since the peak of the pandemic, but it's still a rather high number, 8% uh, of the population in King and Snohomish County qualify for our state food assistance program. And that number is actually double digit, over 20% in Grays Harbor and Okanagan County. So the consequences of how we do this I think has um, implications for us being able to narrow those disparities and the other important disparities that you refer to in home ownership. And we at Commerce also are participating in a study the legislature gave us to uh, bring them recommendations on how to reduce those disparities uh, in home ownership. Now I'm gonna ask everybody to, uh, I have a sense that hybrid is here to stay I'm going to ask you if you agree with that and how it's manifesting itself in the organizations that you are a part of. Um, who wants to take that one? Chris, you want to start? Sure, happy to. Uh, yes, hybrid is here to stay. I, I, I agree with that. And there's a, as a math guy, there's a broad distribution within hybrid, right? Uh, um, I, was, I appreciated Dr. Romero's uh, slide about the 1980s when the personal computers and the and the and the newspaper article from the Washington Post, and then showing like while well, we were still working in the in the workplace, in spite of uh, that observation, then that we can work from home. I think what's different in 2020 and 2021 is the uh, communication gap that's been bridged with technology, right? And so now we can question whether we need to be anywhere in person if we can accommodate that communication gap. And that's a broad, rich mix of things. There's some conferences, we're super glad to see our friends in the same room together. I'm really grateful for that. And there's other conferences we say, you know what, I think a Zoom call would do, All right? And it just depends on the content and what that interaction looks like as to what that feels like. I do think hybrid uh, is here to stay. Uh, I think the workers uh, are, are really uh, happy for that, right? And, and how we accommodate that is super complex. I think there's a big business and a little bit business difference in that regard. And um, small businesses need big businesses more than anything. And what happens with the large employers, I think, will uh, also drive a lot of these trends in terms of how the rest of us react. Uh, yeah, no, I think, um, like I said earlier, the, the, the trends that we had seen, this has been exacerbated by this pandemic. It has forced us to really look at different modes for um, coming to work. Um, and I do agree, it's at some form, hybrid is here to stay. That being said, um, at the start of this pandemic, there was a, uh, that phrase, essential worker. Like, what does that mean? Who is an essential worker? And frankly, there's going to be another equity gap when we talk about, I'm not gonna presume you know, here, but I'm, I'm presuming anyway that most of us have that flexibility to work from home if we needed to. But there's a lot of people out there, the essential workers who did not have that flexibility to work from home. And so the question becomes, as uh, from policymakers, from uh, organizational um, um, efforts, like what do we do to make sure that essential workers, uh, that we get some definition around that? Like what, what are some, bottom line, baseline um, support services to ensure that that category of worker is better understood and better supported and recognizing that some folks just will never have that level of flexibility to work from home. That's a great point. Um, Marty, uh, thank you for bringing up broadband. Uh, let's add childcare into that mix as something that's essential for uh, workers that are navigating uh, this balance between home and work and whatever hybrid means. And what are your observations on how the hybrid nature of work is gonna go forward? 
Well, I, I really appreciate the comments around um, essential workers um, because we have those. Um, we operate, um, you know, a multiple multiple branches and people want access to their money and uh, they want to know that they can walk into a branch and someone's going to be there and and in times of crisis it becomes even more important and so we're trying to figure out not only the essential worker that actually physically has to show up to work each day but also we have essential workers that are part of our call center so they're working from home but they're they're incredibly essential but they need child care um, flexibility, they need assistance. And so SCCU is really looking at, okay, how do we create our own mechanism for childcare as an employer? Um, that is not just your 7.30 in the morning and that you can drop your child off and you better be getting them by six o'clock or you're, you know, you're not getting them back out, I guess. I, I never understood that as a mother, like what happens if I don't get there on time um, <laughs> uh, to be able to pick up my kids when I'm running around crazy. But um, we're trying to figure out what is those, you know, do we need to be providing childcare as, a, as an employer for our employees that might get the hybrid option and the, the gift of working from home, so to speak, and the flexibility of that, but they still need help. They still need a place to be able to perhaps have their child be, you know, do some um, after school homework and a tutor with that or just basic childcare. And can STCU perhaps be a provider of that in different locations that maybe it's from, six in the morning until 10 o'clock at night because some people are working right from five to 10 and they need the flexibility to be able to say, hey, I just need a drop off here or I need access or assistance. So that's one thing, Lisa, we are being, we are really looking as an employer to providing our own employees a benefit of childcare, but we're gonna need help from a policy standpoint from the state on how we do that. Um, and some flexibility and some breathing room because there's some pretty significant things you have to do to be deemed as a child care provider, as you well know. Um, and then again, um, we serve rural markets. We're in Othello. We are in OMAC. We are in Brewster, Washington. Um, we're in Republic, Washington. And so again, for our employees to have the ability to be hybrid, they need access to broadband. And just because you know we're STCU, it doesn't mean that, oh, that's great. We can have we're opening a call center a bilingual call center in Othello right now and we're struggling around truly being able to provide the right broadband to support the needs of what our members are going to need and what our um, employees are doing so we're investing we're trying to find the partners in these different markets that need help and trying to figure out how we you know elevate and lift up um, what each in community individual need looks like and identifying that on a map so that we can work with uh, other organizations like Anovia and AWB and others who are trying to figure out then again from a policy standpoint, where are the hot spots in our state that really need focus in this area. Well, and thank you, uh, Laura, for having a whole session on that this afternoon. So looking at that whole issue of digital equity, I think that's right on target. Um, I'm going to ask one other kind of uh, question that we'll answer quickly, and then we can turn to some audience interaction. At the same time that we have a focus on how tech is transforming industries and our, our largest corporations, I am sensing with the great resignation, whether it's overplayed or not, a lot of people who don't want to return to a big organization and entrepreneurship and smaller um, uh, individual owned or gig economy workers in the creative sector um, seems to be a phenomenon that's occurring. The, the maker economy of small making and craft, whether it's um, distilleries and breweries and and wineries or food products, et cetera. So what are people thinking about the significance of entrepreneurship and the focus on the entrepreneur and the small business? I'll, I'll jump in there. I, you know, It's always important. It's an important part of the economy. However, I want to create awareness that most entrepreneurs come from an established, if not a big business. Right? If you look at the tech uh, diversity we have in this region, you go back to the late 1990s, uh, when so much talent left Microsoft and started so many companies that led to the first dot-com boom. So I want to just make sure we appreciate our large employers as the nurturer of that workforce and that talent base. 
which then feeds into entrepreneurs, which absolutely is a critical part of our regional economy. You know, I think, um, again, I'm going to keep hitting this whole thing around the, the pandemic has forced so many of us to rethink everything. You know, it, it, was a, it was a global trauma. It was a global trauma. And one of the graphs that Chris displayed where you saw that dip, you know, um, if you, you read that on the EKG chart, you would know that something bad has happened. <laughs> and everybody has, you know, has been asking themselves, who am I? What am I? How, how am I going to um, go about my day? And... Um, the, 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 the minute the, the Zoom or Microsoft Teams came into our home, that, that, that the sacred separation between work and home was gone, gone forever, right? And so I think even my own personal example, you know, I, I left a very good company in the life, you know, working, you know, supporting life science community to come in for a social enterprise because I had to ask that same question, okay, where, where do I want to be spending my time in the midst of all of this? Um, another hat that I wear, uh, I'm a trustee on the Seattle Colleges District, and um, you know every community college is experiencing dramatic enrollment declines across the board. But I think what makes this different, normally, historically um, speaking, during recessions, you see enrollments pick up in community. Not this time. Not this time. And I don't know, I don't have a theory on why, but something is happening with folks who are like, hey, where am I fitting into this economy? What does this economy look like going forward? I think there are some big questions that I think collectively we're going to have to, to answer and ask. Do you want to respond, Marty, before we take questions? Yeah, I would just say from a financing perspective, I, well, one, I appreciate the comment that, you know, there's a place for large uh, employers and um, because that large employer base, there's um, community giving, there's things that go on, right, with that large employer, employers like STCU who go and fund $500,000 worth of hotspots for school buses and kids and uh, places that um, our community or our east side of our state need um, access to. But we are trying to evolve and we have, I think the financial sector and the industry needs to, um, really, I love the comment of the nurturer of the talent base. How are we going to be the nurturer of financial access um, to support kind of the maker economy, the creative economy? We're moving out of the traditional bricks and mortar of, you know, uh, CNI type real estate things. And how do we do that better? How do we be willing and understand the risks involved in that? Um, and how do we create access to um, financial capital for these small businesses that don't necessarily fit the you know, quote unquote, typical model. And I think uh, the credit union space is a really good place um, to try to learn and do some um, evolution and test opportunities in this space. And I know SDCU is looking at that and I'm gonna steal the, how do we be the nurturer of the financial component for this economy? That's a great point. How about some questions or comments from the audience? Go ahead, Randy. I love being in a room where like, I know I can call on somebody. I feel like I'm back in the classroom again. It's great. I'm Randy Hodges with the University of Washington. So the New York Times had an interesting um, story this morning about what's happening in the Detroit public school system that in order to retain teachers, they need to give them Fridays off. And we all know what happened here in central Puget Sound the day after Veterans Day with Seattle and Bellevue. There just weren't enough people to teach. So in, you know, we've, we've been living with the 40-hour, five-day work week for over a century. Was, if Margaret's still here, she's gone. I think it was in the early, early 1900s. So instead of talking a little, I'd like to hear your thoughts, not just about hybrid work, but what about the amount of work? When, when, when will we or are we beginning to see the beginnings of a four-day uh, work week as opposed to the traditional five-day work week? Well, I, I, I'll answer sort of a big picture level in my view. It comes down, in my judgment, uh, how we gauge quality of life, right? And it ties into the motivation to work. I think uh, for most people, you're on two, two dimensions of working. You're either, we are either working for fulfillment or compensation and any combination therein, right? Teachers have been asked for too long altruistically to give of themselves for the fulfillment component while we've been holding them down on compensation. So now we're in the situation where, uh, per Margaret's stories, like th these crises give people a moment to say enough, I wanna change this. 
And I think too much our quality of life metrics are in all the consumerism side of things that, that make people feel like they, get a, they, they, they need to stick in whatever compensation they can earn. So we need to figure out a way to disrupt all that uh, to rebalance um, compensation. We talk a lot about a living wage. Right? In this region, I would wager that right now, sorry, uh, to, in 2021, uh, uh, a good number is closer to $60,000. It used to be kind of in the mid-50s, but given the way it's kind of r running up there. So we're talking about a minimum wage of $15 an hour, which doesn't come anywhere near that number, right? So how we feed all that in, factor in uh, concerns about inflation, like, well, yeah, maybe you don't need to buy quite so much. Maybe we don't need to complain about, uh, about consumer inflation. Maybe we need to just readjust what we're thinking about quality of life, and then how to help uh, families that are bono that are underneath that, what 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 that living wage is, how to get employers to own that obligation, and to make it all fit together. But that's that's the altitude that I am at on those conversations. I think your quen your question is spot on because compensation is not just the paycheck; it is also flexibility, autonomy, when to do your work, and how much time you get off. We have a new concept now that we're talking about at Commerce, which we're calling off-off for, for, the, for the management uh, uh, executive leadership level and, and, and actually promoting it for all because there, there's work that's waiting for you every time you pick up your phone. And so what we've asked people to do is to take some time off-off and actually disconnect um, from the organization, delegate your responsibilities first, please, and make it clear how someone can, can uh, reach the organization and get their needs met. But, but still take that time off off because honestly, I feel doing that as an employer is key to retaining um, um, my talented workforce during a time when so much is being asked of us. It's all good stuff, by the way, by the legislature. But we're being asked to, to do things at a whole, um, uh, level higher than we were pre-pandemic and thinking about how that's going to work for teachers and workers across the spectrum I think is going to be an important part of the future dimension of retaining of retaining talent and recruiting people to work. Another Lisa, question? I just, oh, go ahead, Marty. Well, I was just going to insert there too. I mean, um, we, for my own, speaking for myself and for my marketing team, that's a kind of a, that's a very creative group of people and, you know, I don't need somebody working um, the 40 hour week, week, Friday, to, Monday to Friday, eight to five to help me come up with a different brand strategy or um, a new ad concept that can be done at 1030 at night. And so we have been working to move away where we've determined that there are two days a week that we all agree to be kind of online working together um, and being available from the hours of eight to five. And then those other remaining three days, um, because of the nature of who I've hired, the age of them, quite frankly, and what they're juggling, if their work is getting done and they're working from getting online at four o'clock in the afternoon and working until nine o'clock at night, because that's what works for them, I'm okay with that. And we have our, as long as I understand that, so I know when to communicate with them, it works. And, and it's kind of been a really fun thing, but it's a recruitment and a retention um, I have been able to access two really phenomenal creative design people because of that a flexibility and approach. Other questions or comments? Yes, somebody back here. Can we, yeah, come, come on over to the mic so we, the folks at home, we can't forget about the folks at home. Hi, Terry Lundin with Coughlin Porter Lundin. I'm a, in a in building design world and I um, wanted to speak to remote work and some of the comments that um, about that in the past management systems were based on being in person and we want to go back to our old ways of doing things because that's what we understand. Um, our firm has found remarkably uh, surprised us that <laughs> we are more efficient uh, and our financial picture is, is brighter remote. We get the work done very efficiently. We have about 100 people. But what we haven't had happen is mentoring, learning, creativity, sharing of ideas. And you know, if, if we were cold hard managers, we would say, let's just keep doing this remote thing. It's great. <laughs> but our staff, and especially our younger staff, really wants to be back in the office um, to learn, to, to 
communicate with other people, to interact, um, and um, so that's that's driven us to a hybrid model at this point. But I, I don't think, at least in our world, remote is is viable in the long term. Any comments? Yeah, I'll say that we're, we're the same place. Most of commerce's work can technically be done at home, but we're building in collaboration days uh, for teams and for the whole agency so that, um, for example, new workers have a chance to meet people. We think that job mobility um, is fostered by face-to-face -face conversations and being part of in-person conversations. It's harder, especially for new people to access the culture of the organization and to interject themselves into conversations with the teams or Zoom. And so we're, we're, we're doing a mix of both of those. Any other comments? Yeah, just um, I, I think your point's very well taken. And, you know, as, as Chris noted, like there's a, there's a spectrum within that, that hybrid workplace, right? And, and I remember at the early days of the pandemic, um, <laughs> everyone wanted a, a, a take, a hot take. It's like, oh, downtowns are dead. Office is dead. Like, it's like whoa, time out. This is not the first um, pandemic that humanity has ever had. We, we figure it out because at the end of the day, we're social creatures and we need, we need that. And I think your point around younger uh, workers are so important, um, uh, especially given how transient our labor market is. Um, for better or for worse, the workplace is, is an important institution for folks, you know, for that social connection. Um, uh, to help them think about what is the next step in their career and their future and building that network. You can't build a network in your, if you're in your apartment looking at a screen. And, um, and so I, I, that's why I fundamentally believe um, the office space will, will not go away because it is that central gathering place and employers are going to have to be creative and figure out what is that balance. And in every company, every industry is, is, is different. You know, when I was working, uh, with Alexander Real Estate, that we build uh, facilities for life science companies. Like, you know, you can't put a lab in your in your garage. You know, and so you have to have that physical place where you bring scientists and researchers in to do that work. And so, um, uh, and and we'll find that. I, I just believe that we'll find that that balance um, as as a community. Thank you. So I'm going to take point of personal privilege and ask a question, which is for decades, the model of economic development has been to attract companies. We saw that just before the pandemic with the, the race for HQ2 for Amazon. Um, and obviously for manufacturing, for life sciences, having headquarters, having companies in your town does attract workers. But with the hybrid model, how much is that model of economic development tools um, not dead, but how, how, what is the balance and, and what's going to take its place? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for that. I, you know, I, I believe a framework for economic development is unchanged, which is to be a good place first and foremost. And no, no matter what community you are across the state of Washington, be a good place. Be a good place to live, work, and play. Second, take care of what you got. Take care of the workers you got and the businesses that you have. And then third, go after what you want. And it's not linear or chronological, but it's certainly foundational to be a good place for all people to thrive in your community, uh, take care of what you got. And then there is a role for going after, after what you want. Be intentional about the kind of, kind of economy and the kind of, kind, of, kind of community that you want to be. In Washington, we tend to take that for granted. And that's the other organization that I lead, as most of you know. Uh, that's what Greater Seattle Partners, that's what our mission is for there. It's sized, I think we can invest more in that business and traction to go after what we want. This is the land of growth management in Washington State, right? We tend to take growth uh, for granted and as an input, but let's be intentional and go after the type of growth that we want and then drive that with inclusive and equitable growth. And at Commerce, we're taking the approach at looking at the regions of the state and, what, and the communities and their visions for their future, as well as each industry sector, and what can we do as the public sector to help them stay on the cutting edge of that sector. So we have an industry cluster accelerator program that's all about helping uh, uh, tech or maritime or life sciences um, build collective impact organizations that can help um, them stay on the innovative edge and uh, build out 
um, their industry, industry throughout the state. At the same time, we need to look at each region. What are their barriers? What are their opportunities? What is their vision? Northeast Washington doesn't want to be just an extractive economy. They want to also look at food product um, processes that are, are beyond just the extraction part. They, they have recreation and outdoor activities. Uh, if we can nurture, I think, um, having the base of high-speed broadband and eliminating the child care deserts in our state as kind of a base for everyone, that, that everyone deserves no matter where you live, then I think each uh, community and regional economy can build on that, on their vision. There's one thing we haven't said yet that i uh, just quickly make sure we get out there, um, is affordable housing. And that, that uh, I can tell you on a nationwide basis right now, that will even things out. As, as much as technology, as much as everything else, people will move to where they can afford more housing for a better quality of life. And this region needs to build more housing to keep that from happening if we don't want that to happen. One quick question. I think we're almost out of time, but let's do it. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Reed Saras. I work on public benefit projects at McKinsey. Um, and we were considering, uh, when I uh, launched a nonprofit many years ago called Equal Opportunity School, 70 people pressured to go remote before the pandemic. I dove into the academic research on it and came across a number of the dangers and downsides, which is that it actually significantly increases conflict. It's much easier to have conflict with people from behind a keyboard, behind a screen, turn them off at the end of the meeting, don't run into them in the hall. And uh, I wanted to get people's thoughts on that because at a high point of segregation in our schools, post Brown v. Board, residential segregation, segregation of news sources and information polarization in our country, the only thing uh, in the research shown to really overcome that is coming together with others in common purpose. And the workplace seems like one of the last places we have that. So uh, interested in people's thoughts on that. I, 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 I agree 100%. Um, our, our country, we've, I feel like over the years, have steady lost truly democratic institutions that brought different communities together. You know, my, you know, I'm a military brat. My father, 30 years in the military, that brought people together. He was drafted to go to Vietnam. That dropped, you know, forcibly brought people together. The public school system is another place where supposedly you're bringing people together um, across racial lines, social economic lines. We've lost a lot of those institutions that bring people together. And it was so fun. I would joke with my daughter. She's starting high school this year, but you know, she spent, you know, obviously last year under um, the Zoom world of school. And I was joking with her, saying, "Why are all your classmates' videos off? They're all off. Like, where is it? You're just listening to your teacher just talk, and there's no interaction." She's like, "Well, I don't want to look at myself, and I don't want to look at." It's like, and, and and I felt so bad for her about that really important socialization. And to your point, how to deal with conflict, how to see people uh, from other walks of life, and um, I'm just glad she's back in school and and um, and and trying to trying to catch up for um, not so. I don't want to be dramatic. A year lost, but it, it, it there was an impact. There was an impact. Marty, did you want to answer that one? Oh, we have another question here. Yeah. And then, so. And then I think we're going to get the hook. <laughs> So uh, Chris Larson with Equity in Education, and so we work around a lot equitable access um, to our underserved communities and our immigrant communities. And it's, it's great hearing all the responses, uh, especially I just heard a gentleman talk about the younger generation needing to be in the office, which is something that we've definitely seen. But then we also have seen the older generation that are looking like they're, they're preferring to be out of the office, especially when they have families and whatnot. And of course, with all these struggles of I-5, uh, it makes a huge benefit. But the problem is that we're seeing is in a lot of our communities is that they don't have equitable access to internet. In other words, they may have access available, but they just can't afford it. And so we've been working with UW and other community organizations to develop community-based broadbands that is ran and owned by the community. And one prime example is we're taking this over to Eastern Washington to Euphrata area, because even one of our employee, they can't get high-speed broadband to their house, but we can build out a community broadband that gets them 100 megabit to their, to their home. And it benefits everybody within that community that can use that network. So how do we, 
how do we get more involvement so so people are looking at these community networks that aren't profit driven by corporations? I'm going to uh, take the leeway as the moderator to say, please come to the last session of the day <laughs> because um, our uh, director of digital equity, Ernie Rasmussen, yep. and there's a couple of other people on a panel to talk specifically about that topic and I think you are um, absolutely correct that this needs to be community-based. That's why we've supported a concept called uh, the BAT team, which are uh, broadband access teams mm -hmm. in different uh, communities and counties. So um, because we've run out of time, this has been great. Thank you so Thank much you. to all of our participants and our audience members and looking forward to uh, digging deeper on the broadband issue later in the day. Thank you.